Welcome back to part two of the Public Financial Disclosure Review Massive Open Online class. Uh, my name is Patrick Shepard, and I'm really pleased to join you today as we debrief our exercise. And what we'd like to do today when we debrief the exercise is just go through one line at a time uh, and figure out if we have any potential for conflict, think about ways that we might resolve those potential conflicts, and uh, consider whether or not the information that's included on this report is complete and accurate, or if there is information that we still need. Uh, so I hope you've had an opportunity to, uh, to, to go through the form and make some notes yourself, think about some questions you might want to ask. And before we get started, I just want to remind everyone what it is we're trying to accomplish with uh, the review of our public financial disclosure report. The first thing we're thinking about here is preventing potential conflicts of interest. And that happens when there is an overlap or a nexus between the official responsibilities of a government employee, in this case our filer, and the assets and uh, the assets income and positions disclosed on the 278E. So we're really looking for a nexus between the work they do for the government and the things that they've reported. Uh, so we, we can think of some questions to help guide our review. And those questions are, do you have enough information to determine that each entry either poses a potential conflict or would definitely not pose a potential conflict? Uh, so we need to be able to decide for each thing that they've placed on this form that they've reported that we can either say not going to be a problem, we don't need to do anything, or there's definitely a potential problem here and we need to take steps. Uh, so that's the next question we have to ask, uh, answer is, you know, have we taken all steps necessary to avoid potential conflicts of interest? Because when we go to certify the report, we're going to certify that the employee is in compliance with all applicable uh, laws and regulations. So when you conduct your review, it's a good idea to have your compilation of federal ethics laws uh, readily handy, as well as your copy of OGE's regulations, because you'll need to refer to them throughout uh, to make sure that where you identify possible problems, you have the information you need uh, to, to resolve them. But one of the laws that we have to make sure they're in compliance with is the Ethics and Government Act. And the Ethics and Government Act prescribes in quite significant detail the precise information that must be disclosed on the 278. And the reason for this is because this is a public report. Uh, ultimately, these reports may be requested by the public and inspected so that citizens can be certain their government leaders are free from conflicts of interest. And the Congress has carefully considered what information ought to be reported. So in addition to the substantive conflict of interest laws and the standards of conduct, we need to think about the completeness of the reporting. And so questions to help us do that are, does the report tell a coherent story? Does it make sense as a whole? Um, you know, if we see an entry, does that correspond to another entry, or does it seem the correspondent is missing? Uh, so I think that's one thing you can consider as we go through is, you know, does the story this report is telling make sense? We also want to think about the Financial Disclosure Guide, which we talked about in Part 1. Uh, it has a lot of information about exactly what information must be included in the report. So we want to find out if each entry is complete. Uh, so that's another, another step, another question that can guide our review. And finally, because these are public reports, uh, something that can also help us to make sure we have enough information here is, uh, could a member of the public understand the report? Uh, are the things disclosed here? Uh, do they make sense on the report if, if you didn't have special, special expertise? So these are some things to think about as we go through the review. Uh, so here we have the cover page, and the cover page is very important because it tells us what our filer does. Uh, and in this case, I've completed this report in the integrity training system, uh, and I'm uh, pretending to be OGE's chief information officer. Uh, so that can give us some information about the potential conflicts we might we might encounter. So things that uh, that involve IT hardware, software, uh, IT services, telecommunication services. Uh, those are the kinds of things we're going to want to be looking for as we conduct our conflicts of interest review. Um, so that's a really important piece of information. This is the first piece of information we need, even before we start the review, is an understanding of what it is the filer does for the government because their uh, duties and responsibilities of the government are half of that conflicts of interest equation. So let's get into the, re the report. Uh, so we start with the filer's positions held outside of the United States government. Um, and this is good because we often have assets and income that are related to these kinds of positions. Uh, and by starting here, we can start to see the story of the public financial disclosure report unfold. So here our first holding is uh, a board member position at a nonprofit called Marina Stage. Uh, so this looks like it may be uh, 
Uh, we, we could Google it, uh, but it looks like it may be a community theater uh, type organization or a theater nonprofit organization. Uh, and he's a board member. So that's important information for us to have. Um, and the reason for that is as a, a member of the board of directors, uh, the financial interests of the Marina stage uh, are imputed to our employee because as you are probably aware, uh, 18 USC section 208 imputes the financial interests of anyone with whom an employee is serving as officer, director, trustee, uh, general partner or employee. So in this case, being a member of the board of directors, if that's indeed what this position is, uh, would impute their, their financial interest. The good news for us about this from the perspective of 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is the nexus between this filer's responsibilities as the chief information officer and uh, a, a non-profit uh, theater organization, there probably isn't a nexus. Uh, so we can likely determine that this position doesn't pose a potential financial conflict of interest. But Section 208 is not the only position that we are uh, not the only uh, law or regulation that we need to be concerned about. Um, so we might look and see if this person's received uh, guidance previously or has completed a prior approval request that's been processed. And in case they have, uh, it may be sufficient to remind them to continue to abide by the guidance we've given. Uh, if you're not familiar with how to conduct a, an outside activities analysis, we do have a massive open online course to help you with that. But some of the things that we might think about um, in, in the context of a review, if we've not already provided advice, we'd want them to go through the full process. But some things that come to mind immediately are the possibility of a problem under 18 U.S.C. Section 205. And this is just a cautionary thing to make sure our employee uh, isn't making representations on behalf of the nonprofit organization before the federal government because they could inadvertently uh, contravene Section 205. Maybe also caution them about fundraising in the workplace. It's a nonprofit, so they're reliant upon uh, fundraising uh, or, or you know charitable donations so we might have cautioning there and again thinking about the prior approval and something we might ask about is whether or not this is a compensated position you know typically these kinds of positions at nonprofits aren't but if it's the first time we've seen it it's probably worth asking so this is sort of a moderate uh, concern position if we saw this for the first time on a report and would probably uh, require us to engage in some advice and counseling activity to make sure that our, our filer it doesn't inadvertently get into any difficulties. The next, uh, the next uh, entry um, is a little more concerning um, because it looks like it's an IT consultant uh, working for a technology corporation. And being that our employee is uh, the CIO of our organization, this may pose us some challenges uh, because there may be that nexus between his duties as the chief information officer at the Office of Government Ethics and his role as an IT consultant for Inatech. And one of the questions we're going to want to think about is we have a lot of rules that might come into play. Uh, if Inatech does business with the federal government, we may have concerns that our, our filer might make representations on behalf of the company, and those might be prohibited under sections 203 and 205 of Title 18. 208 analysis is going to be a little different, a little challenging here. Uh, he says he's a consultant, um, and as you know, the financial interests of a company are imputed to a filer or an employee if they're serving as officer, director, trustee, general partner, uh, or employee. So the question here is going to be, is this person an employee of Inatech or are they a contractor of Inatech? Because if they're a contractor, their financial interest is going to be limited to the fees that they receive from Inatech. If they're actually an employee, uh, that means that all of Inatech's interests are imputed to them so that if they were to take any official action that had a, had a direct and predictable effect on Inatech, uh, we could have a potential violation under Section 208. So the scope of any recusal is going to be really dependent on that question. Uh, we also might have concerns about uh, about Inatech supplementing the salary of the employee, uh, the employee misusing government time or information, uh, impartiality concerns if they're not an employee. And what we really want to see is, do we have a prior approval form on, on record? Have we looked at this before? Because if not, we need to sort of stop everything and go through the whole battery of, of, um, of advice, go through all of these issues, work them out, and see if it's possible for our, our filer to maintain this position while also working as our CEO. And that's going to have a lot to do with whether or not our agency is currently doing business with this firm. 
Um, and we also want to see if they have compensation or other kinds of assets related to this position. So we'll be keeping that in mind as we go through the rest of the report. So I think this would be kind of a, a blinking orange to red light if I saw this for the first time on a CIO's form. And I'd want to take steps immediately to make sure that we analyze all the potential issues, get them all the advice they need, and if necessary, uh, think about having them resign from this position if it's impossible for them to do their government job while avoiding conflicts with this outside position. So here we, we have some more information on part two as we turn the page and look at this next section. Uh, our filer reports consulting fees uh, in the amount of $22,000. So that seems to suggest a contracting type role, but again, that's something we're really going to want to think about as we do this analysis, because it's possible that they could be an IT consultant in, in the sense that Initech has clients and he is a consultant for those clients. Uh, so we want to think about the possibility of clients, but also that he might be an employee, in which case Initech's interest would all be uh, imputed to our filer. And we have all the same concerns that we had when we looked at it in part one. We just have a little clearer picture of, of the, the filer situation. Uh, so we have an indicia that, uh, that there's an IRA, an individual require, um, a retirement account here. He's indicated it belongs to his spouse, so I think technically this should go in, in another part of the form. But we have the information here. We're really concerned about our conflicts of interest analysis for underlying holdings here. So what really we need to do is conduct our conflicts of interest analysis uh, on the actual underlying holdings of the report. And if this were the only error on this report, uh, I think I would accept it as is and maybe make a note to them next time to put it in the other section. But since we're going to be going back anyway, we could maybe uh, maybe fix this technical error. error. Uh, so these kinds of accounts, uh, we call them defined contribution accounts, um, are really tax deferred holding vehicles for underlying holdings. And we see these a lot. And one common error we encounter uh, is that filers do not disclose the holdings within the account. So you'll often see something like uh, 401k, and that's it. There are no underlying holdings. Or you see IRA, no underlying holdings. Or 403b, and they won't have disclosed any underlying holdings. All of those letters and numbers tell us is that these are tax advantaged accounts. And these accounts can hold anything from individual stock to cash, bonds, uh, other kinds of equity interest, mutual funds. Uh, all sorts of possibilities are available depending on the nature of the plan. So if you were to see this and there were no underlying holdings, so we didn't have 2.1, etc., uh, we'd really need to go back to the filer and find out what's within those accounts. That's probably one of the most common errors we see uh, on public financial disclosure reports as well as confidential reports. But in this case, they've done a pretty good job and they've told us what's inside of the individual retirement account. So the first thing we have is the Vanguard Total Market Index Fund, and they've even been nice enough to give us the ticker. Um, and it uh, has a value of fifteen to fifty thousand dollars, and it looks like they haven't received any income. So I think the first question we're going to have here is: Is this diversified? Uh, total market index sounds pretty diversified, um, but what we're going to need to do is to go to the Vanguard website, find this fund, and take a look at their prospectus. Um, because we have a particular definition we need to get to to find out if it's diversified and eligible for uh, an exemption under 18 U.S.C. Section 208. But the other question we're going to have is, is it an uh, accepted investment fund? So they've indicated that it is an accepted investment fund, which means the underlying holdings of the fund needn't be reported. But we want to verify that that's true. So we have two important definitions, and it's important to keep these separate in your mind. Uh, on the left, we have the diversified mutual fund, and this is a concept that is important for conflicts of interest. This is about exemptions from uh, the criminal conflict of interest law we find at 18 U.S.C. section 208. Um, and the exemption here is that a diversified mutual fund and unit investment trust, an employee may participate in any particular matter affecting one or more holdings of a diversified mutual fund or a diversified unit investment trust where the disqualifying financial interest in the matter arises because of the ownership of an interest in the fund or trust. So basically what this is saying is you may have a conflict of interest with one of the holdings of the Vanguard Total Market Index Fund, but if it qualifies as a diversified mutual fund, we don't have a problem under 18 USC Section 208. 
So we then get a definition of diversified. And diversified means that the fund, trust, or plan does not have a stated policy of concentrating its investments in any industry, business, single country other than the United States, or bonds of a single state within the United States. Um, so that's really important. We're looking at the stated policy of the fund. Uh, so if it doesn't say we focus in the pharmaceutical sector or, or some other business sector, if it doesn't say it focuses in one country outside of the United States, uh, if it doesn't say it focuses in uh, the, the bonds of a single state within the United States, uh, then it's diversified. Uh, so in this case, the Vanguard Total Market Index Fund uh, seeks to uh, match the performance of the total market. So it does not have a stated policy of, of focusing in one, one area of the economy. This definition is also important uh, to find out if we have an accepted investment fund, which is just a reporting concept. And you'll see that these definitions live in different parts of the regulation. And here the accepted investment fund lives in 5 CFR 2634, which is where we find the reporting requirements. So these are the things that must be disclosed um, on the 278E. And what it means uh, is that we don't have to disclose the, the underlying holdings. And there are some criteria. Uh, an accepted investment fund means a widely held investment fund. Uh, and we've said, OG has said that that's uh, uh, more than 100 people hold the fund. Uh, so the Vanguard Total Market Index Fund trades thousands and thousands of shares a day between many, many, many investors. So we're going to get uh, uh, publicly traded or available, widely held, um, widely diversified, and the filer neither exercises control over nor has the ability to exercise control over the financial interest held by the fund. And then we have a definition. It's widely diversified if it does not have a stated policy of investments in any biz industry, business, or single country other than the United States or bonds of a single state within the U.S. So our fund is going to be widely held. It's publicly traded. We know that because it has a ticker symbol. Uh, the assets of the fund are widely diversified, and the filer does not exercise control over the holdings of the fund. So unless our filer were for some reason the fund manager, uh, which our CIO is not, uh, we also have an accepted investment fund. So for this fund, um, the reporting is complete, um, and the reason the reporting is complete is because it's an accepted investment fund, and we don't have any conflicts concerns because it's also a diversified mutual fund. So our next holding looks to be a stock holding of Adobe Incorporated. Uh, and this raises some, some red flags because Adobe is a technology company. It's very likely that our agency uses some Adobe uh, products, uh, services maybe. So this raises some concerns and we'd want to look and see if we've given any guidance to our filer about staying out of... Um, out of matters that would affect Adobe. And we'd have to give some thought about whether such a recusal would be possible. And we have some additional concerns here because we definitely have that nexus between the CIO's responsibilities and a software provider that's often used uh, in, in, in the workplace. So there may be a potential nexus there. But the other concern we have is the value of this security. Uh, so he reports that he has fifty to $100,000 worth of the security. And those of you that have been doing this for a while know that that's well in excess of the $15,000 de minimis uh, that we have for publicly traded securities. So we're not going to have an exemption available here. Um, so we may need to ask him to divest uh, if, uh, if the recusal is not workable to keep him out of matters that would affect directly and predictably the financial interest of Adobe. So this is kind of a, a blinking red light, and we would hope that we've advised before and we don't have a problem. Um, but if we haven't, we need to call our filer right away and say, you know, stop working on anything in, involving uh, Adobe Incorporated, and then let's talk about it, figure out if you need to divest. Uh, similar but different, we have PayPal Holding Incorporated. Uh, we know that they are a company that is involved in uh, processing electronic payments. There may not be such a tight nexus between our CIO's responsibilities and the services provided by PayPal, but I think this is close enough that I'd want to think very carefully and dig in a little more to make sure that our agency doesn't do any business uh, with PayPal. We don't use any of their, of their, their processing uh, services or otherwise contract with them. Uh, we do have a, a little bit of uh, 
some relief here in that he reports between one and fifteen thousand uh, dollars. So it's possible that our exemption for uh, securities valued at less than fifteen thousand dollars per particular matter uh, may be available to us. One note of caution with that exemption is that the interests covered by it are aggregated per particular matter. So if he had more than one holding that may be in affected by a single particular matter, we would have to aggregate the value of those holdings uh, in order to see if the exemption applied. So this isn't a simple exemption that says anything you hold valued at less than $15,000, we never have to worry about. What it says is if you're asked to participate in a particular matter that affects one or more of your holdings, the aggregate value of those holdings must be less than $15,000 um, in order to use the exemption. Another drawback to that exemption is it requires our employees to monitor the value of their holdings and make sure that uh, in aggregate or in individually they don't exceed that threshold. Um, so notwithstanding the availability of that exemption, you may consider uh, divestiture as, as a better option unless there is some sort of obstacle uh, to doing so. We have another uh, appears to be an equity interest in Goldman Sachs Group. Um, and again, we ask the question, is there a nexus between uh, the CIO's work and Goldman Sachs? And in this case, I, I don't think there's a nexus. So unless we had some reason to believe, you know, maybe we worked in a financial services agency where that could maybe pose a peripheral challenge at the Office of Government Ethics, we don't have any matters uh, uh, that would directly and predictably affect Goldman Sachs. Uh, so we probably don't have a 208 consideration here. And we also do have, we can note here that he has he reports fewer than $15,000 worth of stock, uh, so an exemption may take care of any residual uh, risk. This one's a tough one. Uh, so we have S&P Index Fund. Uh, if I were to see this, you know, I appreciate that it's been reported, but uh, one of the challenges we have is this is probably not the full fund name. And the full fund name is going to be really important because some S&P index funds are diversified and some of them are sector funds. Uh, so we're going to need to go back and find out which S&P index fund this is, because if it's the S&P uh, pharmaceutical fund or the S&P telecommunications fund, uh, it may be a, a sector mutual fund. And then we would have to conduct a conflicts review to see if there is a nexus between that fund and the duties. If it's the spider fund, which is the whole S&P 500 index, uh, then it's probably going to be diversified and it will qualify for an exemption. Uh, in any of those cases, it's almost certainly going to qualify as an accepted investment fund, unless it's something like a managed account. So this would be a definitely have to go back to the filer, find out the full name of, of what this thing is. And finally, we have uh, an agreement. We have a, a pension that the filer has reported with the United, uh, the United Parcel Service. So it looks like this is a traditional pension uh, in that it uh, entitles him to $2,500 per month once he reaches the age of 67. Uh, so these are what we call defined benefit plans as opposed to defined contribution plans. And the difference here is that it's a contractual obligation between an employer or a company and its former employers, employees to pay or provide a benefit at some date certain in the future. Uh, so it's sort of a contractual obligation uh, to make a payment. And this creates a different kind of financial conflict of interest situation than a defined contribution plan. So in the case of the co defined contribution plan, we look to the underlying holdings so the companies, funds, and other assets held within the plan, and we conduct our review vis-a-vis -vis those. In this case, what we have is we call it an 18 U.S.C. Section 208 ability and willingness situation. So the filer's financial interest is in receiving those eventual checks, uh, eventually receiving those benefits. Uh, it does not impute the entire interest of the United Parcel Service to our employee, uh, like owning their stock would. Uh, so our employer here, our employee, our filer would here be prohibited from participating in any particular matters that would affect the ability or willingness of UPS to make good on their pension obligation. So as the CIO at, at the Office of Government Ethics, there's probably no such, uh, no such particular matter they're likely to be asked to participate in uh, because it would need to be a matter that would essentially bankrupt UPS. 
Um, but you could see at some other agency, say an agency that regulates shipping companies, uh, it's possible that that could come up, or if someone was engaged in litigation against the shipping company. Uh, but then we would have to ask that question, is this likely to affect the ability or willingness of UPS to make good on their pension obligation? So we see this reported again, and this is one of those places where you want to see that the complete story is being told, because that's both uh, an employment-related asset, but it's also an agreement and arrangement. Uh, so again, we see it reported here, and we can kind of cross-check that uh, to make sure that it's a complete filing. Uh, four, filer sources of compensation exceeding $5,000 in, in, in a year. Uh, well, the integrity system has been nice to us and told us it's not required for this type of report, and the guide tells us why. Uh, because your sources of compensation exceeding 5000 in a year is for nominee and new entrants only, and we have an annual filer here, so we don't need to worry about Part 4. Getting to Part 5, Spouses, Employment, Assets, Income, and Retirement Accounts. So this is actually where the IRA probably should have been reported, um, but we also have some information about our employee spouse. Uh, and our employee spouse looks like she works for Amazon. Um, and it also looks like um, she has quite a bit of stock in Amazon. Uh, and that may be a bit of a concern for us. Um, and the reason that might be a bit of a concern is that um, Amazon provides uh, web services to a huge variety of clients. They, uh, they, they are a huge provider of uh, cloud computing technologies. So this is another place where we'd want to stop in our tracks and say, does our does our agency or organization currently have uh, business with Amazon? Are they currently seeking business with our with our agency? Have we taken steps uh, to uh, make sure that our filer is not participating in particular matters that would have a direct and predictable effect on Amazon? And we have kind of a complicated conflicts of interest scenario here um, because we have both the salary, but we also have some equity. And analyzing spouses' employment interests under 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is kind of complicated. So if we didn't have the, the Amazon stock reported here, we just had a salary. So this person, you know, just worked there as an hourly worker, no bonus, no pension, no retirement, no profit sharing. Just, you know, just drawing a salary, an hourly salary. Uh, we would have another one of those 18 U.S.C. Section 208 ability or willingness situations. And the question we'd have to ask is, could our filer participate in particular matters that would affect the ability or willingness of Amazon to continue to uh, employ his spouse and compensate uh, he or she at the same level? And if the answer to that is no, he may be able to participate under 208, though we might have some appearance concerns under subpart E, and we probably want to make sure to counsel our employee about possible misuse of position or misuse of public office for private gain under subpart G. But that game's changed entirely when we add the additional equity interest, because the spouse's full financial interests are imputed to our filer, and because it's an equity, it's an ownership interest, we take all of Amazon's interests and impute them to our filer. So now the duty to recuse isn't just about ability or willingness to continue to employ the spouse. Uh, the duty is to not participate in any particular matters that would have a direct and predictable effect on the financial interests of Amazon, full stop. And worse still is that we have more than $15,000 of Amazon stock, so we know that the exemption for securities is not going to be available to us. And this is going to be kind of a sticky wicket because we know that uh, this is the employee's spouse. Uh, you know, if this was the employee's own outside position, we would offer maybe the uh, choice to re maintain federal service uh, but resign from the Amazon position. Here we don't really have that option with the spouse's employment, so this is going to be difficult for us to sort of unwind, but we're going to have to figure out either a way to keep our, our filer out of any government matters affecting Amazon, uh, or maybe asking the spouse to divest of any equity interests uh, so that we can rely only on the ability or willingness recusal, which may allow for our employee to participate in some matters affecting Amazon that aren't of a, a large magnitude. Uh, so probably our best bet is uh, recusal if we can manage it. 
um, or a limited recusal plus a divestiture of, of, the, of the equity interest. That's another possibility. But this is going to be a difficult one, uh, depending on the nature of Amazon's relationship to our, con our, our agency. Uh, so you want to probably deal with that right away, because this is a big concern. Uh, we have an honorarium from Georgeville University. Um, possibility for conflicts of interest doesn't seem very high, and that's going to be uh, largely driven by whether the payment has been received or is a receivable. If it's already been received, there's not a financial interest. Uh, if it were an outstanding honorarium that's owed, say, uh, we might have an ability or willingness uh, recusal until it's been paid. But here it doesn't look like there's a nexus between our CIO's responsibilities and Georgeville University, unless we had reason to believe otherwise. Um, but it may cause us to ask our filer, since we're going back anyway, uh, to confirm that his spouse doesn't have another outside job that uh, has resulted in, in this honorarium. Uh, so it may be an indicia that there's an outside consulting business or outside writing or teaching job or something like that. And it might just be worth worth asking if this is a regular thing or if this was just, you know, they wanted to hear someone from an executive from Amazon come speak to a business class and invited, invited the spouse. So uh, you might want to ask a few questions there. Uh, if Chipotle Mexican Grill... Uh, probably not a nexus between uh, the, the Mexican fast food restaurant and our CIO. Uh, so this is a, a situation where we may be able to determine uh, definitively that we don't have a potential for conflicts of interest. Our agency has never done business with Chipotle Me Mexican Grill. They don't provide services that we would want or need. Uh, we have uh, looks like a publicly traded uh, stock uh, in the company of Twitter. Uh, there may be a nexus here, right? Our 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 agency may have a Twitter account. Uh, we may use Twitter for advertising or recruiting or things like that. And if that's the case, we will want to think about, you know, is that a nexus with the CIO's responsibilities? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it would be important to find that out uh, because we might have a 208 concern. Uh, the nice thing here is that we're less than $15,000, so an exemption may be available provided that a matter doesn't affect more than one uh, of the assets that would aggregate to more than 15000 so this is kind of a tough call. We may, in this case, decide to rely upon an exemption, um, or if it's close and we find that we do a lot of business with Twitter, that divestiture is a better option. On to six, other assets and income. So this is where we report kind of everything else, things that aren't held in retirement accounts, uh, things that aren't held uh, in, in employer-sponsored retirement accounts or individual retirement accounts. And here we have um, a tricky one. It says uh, it's the Fidelity Equity Income Strategy. So for the first three words there, the first two words, if we count the hyphenated one as one word, we're looking like maybe this is a diversified mutual fund. But then they say strategy instead of fund, uh, and then we have to worry. So this is something that you're probably going to see more and more often. These kinds of things are becoming... Uh, more popular, uh, more heavily marketed to regular retail investors, uh, not just the very wealthy. So what we need to do here is uh, fire up our favorite search engine and find out what Fidelity Equity Income Strategy is. And this is what we find. And we find that the Fidelity Equity Income Strategy is a separately managed account. And the word account uh, should send your... Uh, your antenna up because we're going to have a challenge here. And the reason is because when they say it's a separately managed account, it means that it's not a fund. And so if it's not a fund, it can't be an accepted investment fund. It also cannot be a diversified mutual fund. So there isn't an exemption under Section 208 that will manage our Fidelity Equity Income Strategy. And there is not a uh, an exception to the reporting requirement that would allow us not to report the underlying holdings. Uh, so if you recall, these are our two sets of categories, and it's going to fail on both. For the diversified mutual fund, well, it's not a fund. Um, for 2634, it's not a fund, it's not widely held, it's not publicly traded or available, and the filer does have control over and the ability to exercise some control over the interest held by the fund. So this is really like, more like the individual retirement account, where it's just a, an account, it's just a fund, uh, an account that holds other assets. So what we're going to need is we're going to need to find out exactly what those things are. 
Uh, some of them may be uh, mutual funds, and if some of the holdings, uh, just like the holdings of the IRA, if they're diversified mutual funds, the exemptions may be available. They may be securities that are unlikely to pose a potential conflict of interest, uh, in which case we might not have a problem. We just need to make sure they're properly reported. But we also could have equities held within this account uh, that do pose potential for conflict, and then we're going to have a challenge of, of either divesting or managing uh, managing. Uh, potential conflicts through recusal. And we do cover this in the guide, um, and it says very very clearly here a managed account is not an accepted investment fund. So we do need the underlying holdings, and we do need to conduct a conflicts review of those underlying holdings. And one of the real difficulties with working with managed accounts is there's someone else who's making the day-to-day -day decisions about buying and selling things, and they can inadvertently create conflicts of interest for our employee. Uh, so in this case, there's a lot of money being held in this account. Um, so it would be very easy for twenty or thirty thousand dollars of, say, a, a IT company that does business with our agency to be purchased. And you know, they notify our employee of of the change in the account. But maybe you know, they don't take notice or they don't seek advice. So managing conflicts within these managed accounts is a real challenge. Um, and, you know, in many cases, it's necessary for people to get out of them because they're just not able to exercise sufficient control to ensure that they're not, uh, they're not inadvertently or their fund manager isn't creating for them new conflicts of interest. Uh, because oftentimes the communication between the manager of the account uh, and the employee uh, is, is not ongoing and they're making decisions independently. So these are very difficult to manage. Um, every time you see that word account, it's pretty much uh, a certainty that you're going to need the underlying holdings because it's not going to be a fund. So we have some transactions here. Uh, it looks like they sold some Amazon stock and also sold some Inatech stock. Uh, and that raises some concerns. Um, it may be the case that uh, our filer spouse is regularly, re regularly receiving shares of Amazon, uh, which could complicate our... Um, our management of, of a divestiture type arrangement. So that's something we want to look into. And we also want to check to make sure that a periodic transaction report was properly filed. Uh, likewise with the Inatech stock, and this is an example of seeing if the report tells a coherent story. Um, it may be a coincidence that our filer has stock in Inatech, um, but it also may be the case that part of his compensation for that position uh, is coming from uh, is in the form of stock, which would tend to suggest that uh, he may be an employee. He may be more than just a contractor for them. So it also creates a full 18 U.S.C. Section 208 situation because it's an ownership type interest. So we'd really want to dig into this and find out what's the situation within a tech. Hopefully we've already done that in a counseling on the outside activity. Um, but this is a, a strong data point that this may be actually an employment type position. And in any case, if he's going to regularly hold in a tech stock, it creates a full 208 because it's an equity interest. We do have a liability here. Uh, we have a mortgage on a rental property. And this is another example of the report telling a coherent story. Because if I see a mortgage on a rental property, but I did not see any income from said rental property, that may be a reporting error. Uh, so we'd want to get back to the filer and have them properly report the rental property if it was a source of income during the reporting period. And finally, we do have a gift, our travel reimbursement that's reported. And it looks like uh, he received a, a, a travel reimbursement from Marina Stage uh, to go to New York and to see a show. It is valued at $3,600. Hopefully, we've already provided advice. So this is a place where you might want to uh, consult the advice file and see if you've already looked at this. Because if you have, you know, maybe no big deal. Um, and it, it is probable that we could find the exception at 5 CFR 2635-204-E2, which is gifts based on outside business uh, as an exception that would allow this to be accepted. But hopefully our employee has received advice because they came to ask us about accepting the trip uh, before they went. Uh, so that's just something that can help you save time. So again, using these questions can help us 
conduct better public financial disclosure reviews. So do we have enough information to determine we definitely have a conflict or definitely will not? Have we taken steps to make sure that all potential conflicts will be avoided? Do we have a complete report according to the re requirements of the Ethics and Government Act? Uh, but not just that, does it tell a coherent story or does it suggest we're missing information? So in this case, the report is missing quite a lot of information. We're going to have a lot of questions to go back to our filer. And then finally, we can ask, you know, could someone from the outside understand what's going on this, in this report? And if, you know, we're looking at the story of the report and it doesn't make sense, uh, we need to go back to our filer and make sure that it does. So finally, these are the ways that we help to uh, avoid conflicts of interest. The first go-to is exemptions. Uh, again, you know, some of them take care of problems so we don't have to worry about them. For example, the exemption for diversified mutual funds. But some of them require more active management, such as the exemption for um, uh, for interests in securities, where we have a de minimis of, of $15,000 for specific party matters, but that's an aggregate interest, and we need to make sure we stay, our filers are staying below the threshold. So that can be, some of them are easy, some of them are a little more challenging to manage, but that's a good place to start. And if we don't have exemptions available, or they're not going to be workable, uh, we have other remedies. Uh, recusal, merely staying out of potentially conflicting matters, uh, is the, the least burdensome for the employee, and in some cases it may be the only remedy available to us, uh, for example, in the case of a spouse's employment arrangement. We also have divestiture, which is a safe one because it allows the employee to get out of uh, the financial arrangement that's causing potential conflicts of interest, and if they just sell it all, uh, they don't have to worry about it. Um, if that's not workable, we do have a possibility of, a, of an 18 U.S.C. Section 208 waiver. And uh, just a word of caution, uh, you are to consult with OGE wherever practicable. So if you're within arm's reach of a telephone, um, which most of us are 24 hours a day, uh, it's practicable to, to work with OGE. So if you're thinking about a 208 waiver, uh, give us a call and we can work th that through that with you. Um, or a 502 authorization if we have a mere appearance consideration. Really important not to try and fix potential criminal conflicts of interest with a subpart E authorization because it doesn't work. So we have to make sure the threshold question for the authorization is that we have a mere appearance concern. Uh, and finally, resignation. So in this case, uh, we have maybe a potentially conflicting outside position. Uh, so we can ask the employee, you know, you got to pick. You can either be the CIO uh, or you can be a consultant for Inatech. Uh, you can't be both because uh, it poses too great uh, a danger for conflict. So uh, directed resignation is possible. So thank you very much. And I, I hope this has been a uh, a helpful exercise. I hope this helps you complete your reviews of the reports that are being filed this week and over the next few weeks. Um, we, we have a lot of other resources available to you. I'd encourage you to rely heavily on your compilation of the ethics laws and regulations, uh, as well as the financial disclosure guide. And with those two uh, sets of tools, uh, you should be well positioned to have a very successful uh, 278E uh, financial disclosure review season. Uh, we hope that you do have a very successful season and we look forward to seeing you for a training event in the near future.